بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى اله الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so uh, i think this is the last lecture uh, so uh, i try to give some important issue uh, without uh, having time to go to discuss but just as a proposal for uh, further discussion at the end of this session at first outlines of what have been discussed after a preliminary discussion about the terminology of the words related to ethical studies we talked about different branches of moral inquiry and concentrate our discussion on ethical theories ethical theories are the answers to the question of moral criteria and we talked about three prominent forms of ethical theories virtue ethics utilitarianism and deontological theories we talked about islamic ethical theory and inferred that there are different theories articulated with the name of islamic ethics ethical theory muslim philosophers hold the form of virtue ethics that has the same structure as aristotle's ethics but with the different conception of happiness and the kinds of virtues we talked in detail of uh, the conception of happiness different um, distinguish distinguish from Aristotelian conception of happiness and uh, different kinds of virtues. So, Muslim theologians, on the other hand, are inclined toward deontological ethics, not virtue ethics, but are divided into different defenders of divine command ethics, like Ash'ari, or defenders of rational et rationalistic ethics, like Mu'tazil, which accept the power of reason to find the most basic obligation. So, they are uh, in principle, deontologist, not virtue ethics, but two sorts of deontology, divine command ethics and also rationalistic deontology. So we say that Islamic ethics has different elements such as duty, utility in itself, but cannot be enumerated among deontological or utilitarian ethics. It is a eudaimonistic theory and is more akin to virtue ethics, but with a special content. So this just as an outline of what have been discussed. Today, I'm talking about maybe three important issues. Um, one is about the factors of the institution of morality. Institution of morality, uh, not just morality or ethics, institution of morality. But by, what I mean by institution of morality became uh, become uh, apparent in my discussion. You know, morality is a practical science. It is different from mathematics, for example. So its final end is realized by, by our commitment to moral prescriptions. For example, when I'm talking about the courage, I just not uh, to find the meaning of courage or the uh, you know definition of courage, courage, courageness, but just uh, I, I want to be courage a person. So uh, morality is a practical science and its final end is realized by our commitment to moral prescriptions. Different factors must be considered in the way of realization of morality. So if you want to uh, actualize morality in your life or in the life of the society, you need different factors. Uh, we are talking about this. The lack of each of these factors may affect our moral life. Uh, I'm citing this factor from the work of William K. Frankenna. Uh, in his famous book, Ethics, published more than 50 years ago, this is an old book, but a very important and very, uh, you know, good book for uh, the study of ethics, uh, published by Prentice Hall. He enumerates factors of the institution of morality as follows. Uh, some explanation about each of these factors. The first factor is certain forms of judgment in which particular objects are said to have or not to have a certain moral quality, obligation, or responsibility. So the first thing you need for uh, you know actualization or realization of morality or institution of morality in your society or the morality in your life, the first thing is uh, some certain forms, forms of judgment, particular judgments, uh, assert that 
this, uh, for example, action has the quality of goodness or badness, or this is obliged or not obliged, or you are responsible for doing this. So talking about particular things. So this called moral judgments, certain forms of judgment in which particular objects are said to have or not to have a certain moral quality, obligation or responsibility. This is one of the most important factors for moral life because without these, without having these particular judgments, we have not uh, you know, become near to the actualization of morality because only by having general principles like for example, the goodness of justice, we have no way to actualize morality in the practi practical uh, life or in our uh, life or the life of the society. So this is uh, one of the important things. It is different from having general idea about goodness of justice, for example. Judging about this particular thing as a good or as a, for example, just action or as uh, obligation, is different from just having a general idea about or general principles or rules. So this is one of the most important factors. This need more than knowledge to experience also. Yeah, without having experience, you have not uh, ability to judge about this thing because, because uh, in addition to knowing that, for example, the goodness of telling truth, you know, you must know something about this situation. Is it okay to tell in this situation truth or it is not? So this need additional information, factual information. So this is a, one of the uh, things or we neglect uh, always in uh, our life to consider it, to consider or to concentrate on it. So this, the first factor is certain forms of judgment the closest factor to a moral life is these moral judgments, which are usually specific and case by case, like legal and criminal judgment. You know, criminal judgment or legal judgment is not general, is about a person, is about an action. So this uh, factor uh, we call particular judgments or moral judgments. Judgment mean uh, having a um, assertion about uh, moral quality, obligation, or responsibility of a particular thing. So this is one factor. The second factor is the implication that it is appropriate and possible to give reasons for these judgments. So, you know, if you want to say something about, for example, the um, a tree, for example, you say that this tree is old. So you have only right to tell this tree is old or this tree is red or this tree, for example, is not good, when you have good evidence in support of this clay. So this is in factual assertions or factual judgments. In the case of normative judgments also, for example, when you say that this action is good or this action is obligatory, you have right to tell this, to say this, to judge this, only when you have uh, good reasons in support of these judgments. So these reasons called normative reasons. When you, uh, you hear about normative reasons, normative reasons means the reasons uh, cause us uh, to make a belief, to make a judgment about a particular thing, about a, a particular judgment, moral judgment. So this is the normative reasons. So we know that we have the right to judge, for example, this tree is old only when we have the necessary evidence for it. The same is true of certain moral judgment. For example, we have the right to say that it is obligatory or good to do this or that, uh, when, or that when there is a reason for it. This type of reasoning which justifies our moral judgment is called normative reasons or reasonings. So the third factor, so uh, the, the second factor is uh, being ready to justify moral judgments. It is not uh, only uh, the case that we have moral judgments without justification of this. If we have no justification for our moral judgment, so what is the basis or what is the criterion for uh, distinguishing this judgment from that judgment? So in 
and, and not in addition to need other need to have um, particular judgment, we need to have a justification for these judgments. So the third factor is some rules, principles, moral principles, ideals, or virtues in general that can be expressed in more general judgments and that form the background against which particular judgments are made and reasons given for them. So these general uh, you know, principles, for example, uh, telling truth is good, is a reason, is a background for my particular judgment. So my particular judgment is, can be based on this, not uh, just by, it, it is not uh, the case that we can justify always by relying to general principles, because in some cases, we need uh, uh, more than, you know, uh, relying on a general principle, because there is a conflict between some principles. For example, you uh, encounter with a situation that you, you are uh, worried or you have doubt about uh, your duty. Is it, is it okay to tell truth or uh, for the sake of a person to tell, to lie? Which one is better? So you cannot, uh, which one is your duty? So you cannot just only rely on the moral principles, general principles, because uh, in this case, relying on the general principles cannot help you to find uh, your way, your judgment. So you need more than uh, relying on general principles. but. But usually we can uh, justify our um, particular judgments by relying on uh, general principles. So some rulers, rules, principles, ideals, and virtues that can be expressed in more general judgments and that form the background against which particular judgments are made and reasons given for them. Aristotle compares this factor of the institution of ethics, moral principle, with medical knowledge, which has a certain strength and accuracy appropriate to its subject. So moral principles are more accurate, more uh, you know, strength uh, than particular judgments because particular judgments is like you know, giving treatment or prescription um, to a patient uh, by the medical medicine. Uh, is not, uh, it is the using of the result or the fruit of uh, medical science. It is not medical science. It is using medical science for applying in a particular case or particular person. So um, the relation between moral principles and moral judgment is the same. Moral principles is like a moral science, is like a medical science, uh, you know, can be uh, proved, can be discussed generally, but, but particular cases uh, cannot be justified only by general principles or as I refer, it need more than uh, moral knowledge. It need also to know something about the factual uh, situation to know about, about uh, for example, to know this person or this action or the situation surrounding this action. This is the difference between moral principles of so the third factor is moral principles. We need moral principles because uh, usually we rely on these for uh, justification of particular cases. So the fourth is certain characteristic, natural or acquired based. This is uh, one of the important factors uh, for actualizing or you know, reaching at the end of morality in practice. Certain characteristic, natural or acquired ways of feeling that accompany these judgments, rules, ideals, and help to move us to act in accordance with them. You know, there is a controversy about, uh, for example, David Hume from uh, one side and um, Immanuel Kant on the other side, for example, about the you know motivation, moral motivation, what causes us to commit to moral knowledge. You know, we know that this is good or this is bad, but, but, but knowledge is something and motivation to do this or to commit uh, to it is different. So, uh, so the procedure of moral motivation need more discussion. According to Hume, David Hume, always we need uh, to have some uh, feelings or desire 
uh, in accord with our moral knowledge. Uh, even he says that moral knowledge is based on our interests, our desires. So desires is the basis of uh, moral knowledge and moral motivation, according to him. Without desires, for example, to help a person, you have not moral knowledge. You, you, you cannot construct uh, the judgment of helping this person is good. Helping this person is good based according to him on your desire to help this person, on your interest to help this. So it, it basically, uh, moral knowledge and moral motivation basically is dependent on uh, you know, having some feelings or desires or uh, emotions uh, in accord with your uh, moral judgment or duty. But according to Kant, uh, the situation is different. Kant reject the idea of, uh, you know, uh, accompanying, accomplishment of the uh, emotion with uh, moral claims or moral knowledge. According to him, uh, moral knowledge is not, uh, you know, based on moral emo on other emotions, other feelings, and even according to Kant, uh, in coming of the emotions or uh, feelings uh, to the you know field is uh, dangerous for moral behavior according to Kant. so the presence of emotion of emotions along with moral judgments plays an important role in motivating a person to eat if we have positive emotions along with a moral judgment to help an orphan orphan either in the form of natural or acquired pity we will have a better and a stronger motivation to do so. Of course, some philosophers such as David Hume consider the existence of these emotions necessary for moral action and even for moral knowledge, but some like Kant do not consider them useful. But I think it is true that these feelings are a good aid to morality, although perhaps sometimes we can do against them. So we usually need uh, passions or you know, emotions uh, uh, for motivation uh, to do moral things. This is usual uh, or by default, but, but in some cases we can do against our feelings or emotions uh, just for the sake of uh, moral duty. So this is also possible. This is my idea. So the fifth is also important. Certain sanctions or additional sources of motivation that are also often expressed in verbal judgments, namely holding responsible, praising, and blaming. So, uh, you know, it is clear that morality is essential for the survival of a good society and a good life for a person. This is, okay, this is a parent thing. But the question is this, can force and guarantees such as punishment be used to strengthen moral behavior? Is it, is it okay? So if it, you accept this, will not morality then be transferred into a legal system? This is a very controversial and important issue called the issue of legalization of morality sometime or enforcement of morality. Uh, in some uh, books, it is called legalization of the problem or the issue of legalization of morality. Is it okay uh, to legalize morality, to give some, uh, to determine some punishment, for example, for lying, for uh, not helping the person, the neighbor, for example, is it okay? Some people say that this is not okay because this change the essence of morality to the legal system. So it is legal issue, not morality in this, uh, you know, if we accept this uh, issue. Uh, so they are against the legalization of morality or against the enforcement of morality. Uh, but uh, I think the best way is this. Many moral philosophers have ac has accepted a small amount of assurance that is verbal. For example, con condemning, condemning or praising a moral agent or holding him responsible for doing or leaving an action 
is permissible as a guarantee, but more than that, they do not accept. So we have a sort of guarantee or a sort of sanction for uh, you know, enforcing moral behavior in the society, but it is only a verbal, just to say that it is good, you are a very good person, or in some case, it is a bad thing, and so you are a very bad person, so you are responsible just by verbal, you know, praising or condemning. So it is not giving, you know, some penalty or determining some punishment for, for example, lying. So this uh, amount of assurance is acceptable for uh, moral, uh, you know, moral uh, thinkers as a guarantee for morality. So the level of guarantee or level of sanction is in morality is very low rather than in compared to the legal issues. In legal issues, we have penalty of capital penalty, capital punishment, for example, the death or maybe uh, different uh, very difficult penalties. But in the case of morality, so we have no such um, punishments or such, uh, you know, penalties. So. This is the uh, important thing. So we can, uh, by just praising or blaming, we can, you know, make people uh, interested in uh, doing morality. So this is the point. So the last one, uh, which I think also is important, is this: a point of view that is taken in all this judging reasoning and feeling and is somehow different from those taking in prudence, art and the like. This is very important because uh, sometimes you see a person uh, have not, uh, you know, idea uh, about the life uh, more than just gaining pleasure, for example, gaining money. So this person, uh, has not a good uh, theoretical context for commitment to morality. I'm not telling or I'm not saying that it is impossible for him to do some moral issues. No, I think that he has not basic and justified theoretical context for moral commitment. May in some cases he has some commitment, but, but uh, the issue is this. This is not a good context or the good frame for his commitment to morality. In, and uh, in many cases, he, you know, go astray of the moral path because of this frame of this theoretical context. So a point of view that is taken in all. So this word view is different from the theoretical context for prudential, uh, you know, reasoning or from uh, for artistic, uh, you know, behavior or the like. So a proper worldview is essential for commitment to morality. This is important. If one think about this world as a dining table that is ready for use for a short time and we will be assembled soon, then why should one be expected to sacrifice one's interests for another? So this is the, he sometimes may uh, do this, but, but the question is why he uh, must, sacri must sacrifice his interests in favor of the other. So this is the issue. Why should be expected to control his lusts if he think about this world as a, you know, dining table that is ready for use for a short time? This is the question. But if one considers this world as a field for sowing, sowing the seeds of morality whose fruits are to be used during the eternal life of man, one makes the greatest effort on performing moral duties. He does his best with regard to moral duties more than gaining pleasure from this world. So this is the difference between two worlds view. If you have uh, a world view like the first, so it is not you know, uh, usual to do or to commit morality. And if you 
commit, it is accidental, not essential, because it, it doesn't coherent with the framework or theoretical context of your uh, view or your belief. But in the second case, it is okay and it is you know general to do moral things or to commit to morality because of your framework, because of your theoretical context. So uh, this is uh, one hadith in his very famous hadith, that dunya mazra'atul akhara. In other narrations, it is emphasized that this world is a farm. Like farmers, we must save time so that the sowing time is not lost. This is important. You know, اغتنام الفرصة فرص. أن الفرصة تمر مرصها فاغتنموها. This is narration of Imam Ali. Uh, in our narration, it is emphasized that this world is a farm. Like farmers, we are, we must save time so that the sowing time is not lost. In addition to sowing the good seeds, that is the righteous seeds, in the land of this world, we must also take care of what we sow. Sometimes the sown seeds are spoiled. And it is as if the Quran says that human good deeds come to nothing and fail. This is called ihbat in Arabic or in Quranic terminology, ihbat. We must take care of their growth and not bast those seeds with arrogance that leads us to infidelity and atheism. So this is important issue. So, so, uh, I actually, I, I in principle agree that some atheist persons or some, you know, persons with um, materialistic worldview can do some moral issues, some moral things can uh, tell truths, can, uh, you know, help uh, the other person. This is not uh, controversial, but 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 the issue is this: if somebody asks him why you are doing this, he has not good question. This is the problem. Uh, because, because on the basis of his worldview, all things only can uh, be acquired here, or only you know, gains can be acquired in this short time. So why I prefer the other person, person's interest to my interest? This is the question. So this is the uh, problem with such a person. But if you have a you know, good religious worldview and take this world, um, as a farm, so it is okay and it's a very good answer to justify or to give a person, ask you about the reason for um, doing moral things or commitment to morality. So this is acceptable and this is a good answer. So this is the verse of the Nabil Quran. Say, Shall we inform you about the biggest losers in their works? Those whose efforts are misguided in the life of the world, while they suppose they are doing good. They think that they are doing good. And really they are doing good. They are uh, telling truth. But they are ones who deny the signs of their law and encounter, deny the encounter with him. So they, uh, you know, uh, actions uh, all became, became lost and uh, there is no fruit for their, even their good actions. So this is the meaning of Ihbat or this is the meaning of uh, you know, the necessary of having a good context for moral uh, behavior. So uh, the second uh, issue I want to refer related to the last point is the mutual relation between belief and good action. You know, uh, I told that, I uh, said that uh, it is necessary or uh, this is a one of the important factors for moral behavior or having a moral life to have a theoretical, good theoretical context to justify our moral behavior. 
to encourage us to do morality. So this is, uh, can be, uh, you know, uh, noun from the verses of the Nadal Quran I just refer here and so finish this uh, section. The mutual relation between belief and good action. It is remarkable that there is a mutual relationship between moral action and correct beliefs. Just as without the right beliefs and the right worldview, one's moral life is at stake. So without the moral commitment, one's worldview is also at stake. This is a very important issue. So you have at first a good idea, you know, for example, that there is God, you know, you, uh, you ascend uh, the existence of God and so accept the um, reality of God or the prophet or all things is okay with your uh, idea. But, but, but if you have not good actions, did good deeds, amale saleh. So finally, your uh, idea, your true idea is, uh, you know, in danger, is at a stake because of the influence of actions. So actions can affect your mind, your opinions. It is no separated things, op opinions and, you know, actions. Actions can affect the opinions. Also, opinions can affect the action. So there is a mutual relationship. So it is not enough to have, you know, believe in, to believe in God, to have uh, faith in God. It is not enough. If, if it doesn't follow by good actions, by good deeds, amal is saleh. So it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, subject to threat of, uh, uh, you know, damage and destruction. So this is the point. It is remarkable that there is a mutual relationship between moral action and correct beliefs. Just as without the right beliefs and the right worldview, one's moral life is at stake, as I referred. If you have not good, uh, you know, worldview, if you have not faith in God in afterlife, so your morality is subject to damage and so uh, uh, can, it, it is not justified, uh, have no good justification as I referred in last slide, but, but in an, another side also. It is important to know that intellectual and doctrinal errors such as blasphemy and unbelief lead one to behavior and moral errors, behavioral and moral errors, such as lust and lying. On the other hand, behavioral errors and drowning in lust also lead to erroneous belief and sometimes even lead a person who previously thought rightly and believed in God to infidelity. This is very important. Atheism and even mockery of believers. The Holy Quran also emphasize the positive effect of good actions on our beliefs and also the negative actions, negative uh, as, uh, effect of bad actions on our belief. So, to him, to Allah, ascends the good words. The good words mean good opinions. The good words mean al kalam tayyib means good beliefs. For example, faith or for example, uh, believe in the prophethood and of the prophet. So to him ascends the good words and righteous conduct elevates it. So by righteous conduct, you can elevate your opinions, affect your opinions by, you know, this is the um, very controversial or important issue in philosophy, how uh, action can affect the opinion. What is the relation between doing something and uh, having an opinion is, it, is uh, because we think that our opinions come from, you know, uh, reasons, not, not from action. So this, uh, emphasize on the relation between action and opinion. So to him ascends the good words and right use conduct elevates it. The Holy Quran also emphasizes the negative aspect of bad conduct on the beliefs. So 
ان کذبوا به آیات الله و کانوا به های استثنا در بر منی فور اگزامپل بیلیورز بات یو نو نات یو نو فالوینگ دی گود سینگز اند انفورچونیتلی دیل وت سم بد سینگز اند سو یو نو follow their desires, their loss, and so this person finally come to the level. They deny their first faith, their first beliefs, and so they say that there is no God or there is no prophet. So this is the danger of uh, separation of morality from the beliefs. So and kazzabu be ayat Allah fa kanu biha yastahzaun then the faith of those who committed misdeeds was that they denied the signs of Allah and they used to deride them so this is uh, uh, to this uh, level or to this point i just wanted to you know refer to the importance of different things in uh, having a moral life so moral life cannot be acquired only by moral knowledge. For uh, moral life, we need moral knowledge, um, particular knowledge, general knowledge of morality. Then some uh, motivations come from our, uh, you know, uh, feelings or the, uh, you know, having together the feelings, good feelings and good beliefs and also having some sanctions and most important uh, of all of the factors having a good world view so this is the uh, factors can help us to have a good life good moral life in personal uh, life or social life so i come to the second point uh, which is important also you know at first i so this point, practical atheism, in Shahid Mutahari's work. Uh, and then uh, I followed different, uh, you know, uh, writings uh, of the Christian scholars or Muslim scholars and find some uh, good points in also uh, Christian uh, scholarship. For example, there is a uh, book of Pasquini uh, is about practical atheism, for example. And I read some of them and so I had an interview with uh, a person uh, fortunately it is also published in English so I tried to send it to my dear brother Razan and uh, so we can uh, read in detail this idea but I just here uh, refer uh, very briefly to the idea so practical atheism it is the fact that the, the large portion of people, despite believing in God, prophethood, and even the hereafter, are not bound to their religious beliefs when it comes to their actions and ethics, to the extent that there is no apparent difference between them and atheists. So uh, some person, you see that, uh, they say that we are believers. Sorry. So they say that we are believers, we, are, we have faith in God, we are Muslim, we are Christian. So when you come to the uh, you know, skin of life, uh, you know, uh, to scene of life and to practical uh, life. So you, so you see there is no difference between this person and that person, uh, an atheist person. This is also lying and that also lying, or this uh, just try to gain money, also that person. So there is no difference. So theoretically, there is a very important difference. He believe in God, but he doesn't believe in God. But what is the effect of this uh, theory in practice? So there is no uh, you know, difference in the reality. So this is the problem. So some persons, may, may, many of us uh, are believer theoretically. But practically, we are atheists. We are materialists because doing the same as material persons, 
do. So there is no difference. This is very dangerous uh, position because, because we know that, uh, or we think that uh, a sort of complicated ignorance because we think that we know that uh, we are good person because we believe in God, we think, or we thought of ourselves as believer, as uh, you know, having faith. But, but in the reality, we have no faith because we are not bound to the demands of faith. So this gap between theory and action is very, very dangerous because finally, uh, you know, treat our belief also because uh, in the long term, we cannot, you know, uh, have faith and always we follow our desires in some you know, points, there is a clash between uh, this uh, idea in our mind with, uh, you know, justification of our moral conduct, our materialistic conduct. So uh, usually what is lost is uh, belief in God or belief in hereafter. So it is the fact that a large portion of people, uh, despite believing in God, prophethood, and even hereafter, are not bound to their religious beliefs. Then it comes to their actions and ethics to the extent that there is no apparent difference between them and atheists. Their life does not show any sign of God or any attention toward prophethood, prophethood, the Sharia or fear of the hereafter. I think the, the very important point, I just saw this issue in one of the letters of the Pope, of uh, Pope Benedict, uh, the topic of practical atheism has ex existed among amongst different religions. And even Pope Benedict uh, XVI has alluded to it in one of his letters. And he talked about the Jewish person. They think that they are Jewish or Christian person, they think that they are Christians, but really they are not Christians. But practically they are not Christians. So this is the problem also we can see among, among us the Christians. It is not as, you know, only for Muslim communities, but also we have in Islamic communities, this, this very bad things. Many uh, say that we are believer, but there is no difference in the life of these persons and non-believers. So this is called practical atheism or materialism. So, you know, there is an old debate or issue between, for example, Aristotle and Plato about this. The topic of practical atheism, whether it is possible for a person to act in direct opposition of their belief or not, is an ancient debate, is it this? Uh, you know, is uh, one of the dialogue of the Socrates famous that is it possible to know something, to know that there is God, to know that there is uh, afterlife, to know that there is prophethood, to know that we have obligation, uh, you know, to follow, to obey God, all we know, but, but in the reality, in the action, in the conduct, all against these ideas. It is, is it possible? So Plato and uh, Socrates deny the possibility of this and say, they say that, uh, for example, uh, they conclude that in these cases, we have not good knowledge. The problem is th that we have not good uh, and you know, certain knowledge. But Aristotle says that it is possible uh, by having certain knowledge about goodness of this action. To act against this, this is called acrasia in Aristotle's terminology, acrasia or weakness of will. So he accepts and he permits that uh, in some cases, in short, may, maybe in many cases, we know that this is good. We know that this is, you know, commanded by God. But, uh, you know, in the effect, in the effect of our desires or in the uh, control of our desires, we can do something against this knowledge. So according to Aristotle, uh, Plato thinks that always our will is in the control of our knowledge, our mind, our understanding. This is called 
the unity of virtue and knowledge, according to Plato. But Aristotle denies it and say that we have two sources of controlling uh, our will. Um, mostly is our knowledge. We know this and follow in reality or in action our knowledge. This is very okay. But in some cases, our will is affected, but not by our knowledge, but by our desires, our, our, our feelings. So feelings also can control our will, and this is uh, the problem. So uh, sometimes they uh, make us to do against uh, what we know. So this is possible according to Aristotle. And he you know, talked about the issue of uh, acrasia in more details and different form of acrasia, for example, uh, some of cases of acrasia or not following our knowledge is called amoralism, for example, some weakness of will, some maybe different names and different, you know, issue. This is related to moral psychology and is important issue. But, but uh, here I just want to, uh, you know, remember the issue without going to uh, talk about this. So these materialistic ethics can be very dangerous. Such people, despite having a theoretically sound beliefs, become victim of grave and unknown dangers due to their actions. There is a greater chance that such a person would become a victim of their desires and ego and eventually let go of their face as well. Faith can only remain continuous if it is accompanied with action. So moral actions is, has, a, has an important role, role in, uh, you know, even in keeping, uh, uh, you know, the people as a religious members of the society, you know, believers. So uh, this is one of the points I, try to refer that the importance of morality for, you know, uh, you know, intensifying of belief and promoting of beliefs. So this is very important. If you have only belief in God, for example, religious belief or good beliefs, but it doesn't coincide it or the beliefs with morality. So, you are, uh, your beliefs is uh, uh, treated by, you know, uh, uh, or is in danger of damage and loss, and so this is the problem. Uh, Shahid Mutahari has a good discussion about the, the comparison, comparison of, comparison of, you know, theoretical materialism and, mat and practical materialism or practical atheism and theoretical atheism. And so he believed that um, practical materialism is more dangerous than theoretical materialism. And this is very old things because this is very, you know, uh, strange thing because usually we think that um, it is important to believe in God and having a belief in God is more important. And so, but uh, you can also sometimes tell truth so, sometimes lie. So no, this is no, this is not important. So action is not uh, important for us as the importance of theory. So we give more uh, weight to theoretical side of our, you know, life than practical side. But according to Shahid Mutahari, if you, you know, not, uh, coherent your uh, morality, your conduct with your beliefs. So it is uh, in danger of, mm, you know, damaging the beliefs. So uh, if you have bad belief, for example, if you are not a believer or you have not faith in God, so you can, uh, by uh, some reasoning or by some argument can find faith. But if you have faith, but you not, follow your, the demands of faith. So uh, how can I, I help you to be a real religious person? So this is the danger of practical atheism. You can 
see his famous book uh, in Farsi, Elal Girayesh, the El Hat va Madigari, in uh, English, uh, the causes of the uh, factors of uh, inclining inclination to atheism. This is the name of book, and so in his book he discussed the issue. So. I come to the last slide and uh, I keep some time for, you know, answer the questions also. The third point I just want to in this last lecture is something about uh, social ethics. Because, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm talking about Islamic uh, ethics on Islamic literature. You can find many books about uh, purification of the soul, tahzib uh, al-akhlaq, tathir al because usually they, uh, you know, take morality dealing with the person. They are talking about personal morality. They are talking about the virtues of a person. There is no good book uh, discussing or dealing with the issue of social ethics. This is the problem in Islamic literature we have. Also, this is uh, sometimes uh, uh, the same in Christian also ethics. But, uh, but in Christian ethics, especially in modern time, we have good books about social ethics. And social ethics became you know, more interested and more discussed uh, recently. But in uh, Islamic ethics, we have this gap and this problem because most of, I'm not uh, saying that all books, uh, you know, neglected the uh, social ethics, but, but mostly they, uh, you know, focused on personal ethics. They talked about the virtues of, uh, you know, a person to uh, find the happiness. And so they're not talking about the issues I just refer, uh, or questions I just propose here, not, not uh, given answer all of, to all of them because I have not time to go to depths of them. Just just want to uh, you know propose some question for your further discussions. But very important point because because ethics uh, you know is uh, by default by default is a social thing. So principally it is uh, you know a matter of society. So it is not good to neglect uh, the discussion of ethics as a social uh, you know, issue. This is not good. Uh, yes, we have some cases or some uh, philosophers, for example, Al-Farabi, you know, Farabi, he called the second teacher. The first teacher is Aristotle and the second teacher is Farabi, Al-Mu'allim al-Sani. He has a good uh, idea or good discussion about social ethics. And he usually, uh, you know, uh, put ethics under the title of politics. He take ethics a social issue. And, uh, you know, uh, in contrast to many other scholars who prefer personal side of ethics, he prefer social aspect of ethics and take it uh, you know, as a, one of the subtitles of politics and discuss it on the name of politics in some of his books. So this is very interesting, but unfortunately this tradition doesn't continue, didn't continue to, the, to this day. So we have problems with social ethics. I just, uh, you know, give some question or propose some question uh, to, to give the importance of these issues without, uh, you know, discussion of these questions because I have no time for discussions. Unfortunately, morality, although it has more social aspect, is, it has more social aspect, has been less studied by Muslim scholars in their, this regard. Of course, there are some ex exceptions like Al-Farabi, as I refer. More studies are needed for this in the future. Because, uh, you know, uh, there is a good book of Ibn Baja, I've impacted, I think, in English, the 
pronunciation of have impact maybe Ibn Bajah. Uh, he about the tadbir al mutawahhid he assumes that the person uh, for example in bad society or out of the society so he need uh, to order their life or to have their special it's his special moral life so he gives some prescriptions for him but this is a very important issue if you are living in that society, how you can save your life? It is very difficult to save your life or your moral life in a bad society because society surrounds all aspects of your uh, behavior, your conduct, so affect uh, on different you know, uh, sides of your behavior. So, it is important to try to have a good society, having a good society, having a moral society encourages and helps the individuals also to have a good moral life. So uh, it is not uh, possible for all of us to be out of a society, to lie, to lie out of a society and just uh, have our moral uh, conduct. So is, we are, we are, you know, forced in our society. So if a society became good or social ethics of the society became okay, so this helped us to have a good personal morality also. This is important. So the issue of social ethics is very important for having a good society and then having opportunities for, you know, good personal ethics also. But I propose some questions for you to think about and research about it. One of the question is, to what extent am I responsible for the moral life of the society? So this is one of the main question. If uh, the society going, for example, on wrong way, uh, what is my responsibility? Is my job just moral guidance? Just, you know, uh, saying that this is wrong way. This is only responsibility I have. This is uh, the final responsibility. Or do I need more intervention? So if I, you know, suppose uh, to intervene in the case of, in the way of, um, you know, social, uh, life, so how uh, or how much is this okay, this intervention is okay? What is the degree that I have responsibility to intervene in this uh, society? In other words, is enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, which is one of the practical pillars of Islam, is more than a verbal warning and moral guidance, this is one of the issues. So uh, in many cases, uh, if I want to intervene, uh, for example, in the path of social life, so sometimes government or maybe uh, other person doesn't accept and reject my intervention and say that you have no responsibility. I think that I have responsibility to intervene, but they say that you are not in uh, responsibility. So one of the uh, issue in this regard is to, you know, find the right way uh, in the case of Amr ibn Ma'roof and Ahiyah So the second uh, issue is this. Should we teach, I just, uh, as, a, as an example, as examples, I give the question and not enumerate all of the questions here. Just, just try to, you know, uh, give uh, some attention to these points for your further studies. Should we teach our children what we consider morally good and give them the practice of becoming morally within the same framework? Or is it a kind of moral paternalism that liberalism denies? You know, there is a famous book of uh, Popper. 
Karl Popper, uh, the open society and its enemies, uh, which is published in different languages or translated in different languages. In Farsi also, it has two translations, a large book, open society and its enemies. Uh, he discusses about the pol political issue of Plato, uh, because Plato, you know, according to him, is against open society, because he believed that uh, it is not okay. This is the belief of liberalism also. It is not okay for us to, you know, um, uh, cultivate our children or um, the uh, persons in the society in accord to what we think that this is good. So this is a sort of paternalism is rejected by defenders of open society. So uh, is it okay? We have no responsibility to cultivate our children uh, in uh, accord to our understanding of morality. So what is uh, our obligation to, the, uh, to our children? Children, so this is the problem. Should we teach our children what we consider morally good and give them the practice of becoming morally within the same framework or is it kind of moral paternalism that liberalism denies according to liberalism? So this is not okay. This is the other issue. Is it possible to have a good and prosperous life in a society whose people are suffering from poverty and misery? Imam Ali said, if your neighbor is not good and uh, is in poverty, so you cannot be uh, happy, you cannot have happy life. So this is uh, apparent that if some people in the society have not good situation, they are living in poverty, so it is not okay for me to have a good life in this society. But the problem is this, what is my duty? And uh, this is the, issue. How much is the moral demand for caring for the poor? So this is, or the, the, the extent of the moral demanding is very important issue because uh, always in one of the societies in the world, for example, I'm living in Tehran and in Iran society. There are many poor or many, uh, you know, people in poverty. In, uh, uh, our country. But suppose that uh, in your country, for example, there is no poverty, but always there are many countries, many societies, they are living in poverty. So is it the demand of morality that to always you pay attention or give money for their uh, people, for the peoples of the other societies? What is the extent of the demanding of morality. This is a very important issue because uh, if you have not good idea of the demands of morality, it may work against morality. If you take so uh, you know difficult demanding for morality, so sometimes you, you are working against morality in the society, finding the good uh, amount of demands of morality is very important, not in case of the poverty uh, alone, but in all, all other cases, in the help of, you know, people to, you know, uh, give knowledge to make them uh, became aware of different things. So this is the issue or the, the demand of uh, morality with respect to your social relations. This is one of the, how much is the moral demand for caring for the poor? The other important issue is, should justice or generosity be the basis of social order? So there is a narration from Imam Ali and some, some, some uh, of the followers of him asks him about the uh, priority of justice or generosity. Al-adlu afzal amil jud, this is the narration. Uh, so he, uh, Imam says that uh, it depends on the context. If you are talking about the social ethics, justice is more important rather than generosity. Because generosity, you know, uh, causes the societies 
uh, order to be, uh, you know, damaged because, but, but justice is more uh, keeping the order of the society. So justice in relation to sociality is more important than generosity. So generosity also is important, but it, in the second level, uh, after justice, you know, there is a conflict between justice and generosity because generosity is, uh, justice is just giving a person it's his desert, his right, but generosity means that giving a person what he doesn't deserve, or doesn't he's right. So there is a conflict between generosity uh, and justice, but generosity uh, in personal relation is very important. So, but in social, uh, uh, for example, if government follow always generosity and forgiveness and so forgive every error. So what, what is the end or the fate of this society? So according to Imam Ali, al-adlu khayrun. Because, because uh, justice is better because it keeps society in, uh, you know, then the order of the society and so establish the society and not damage the social order, social rules. So this is also one of the issues of uh, social ethics. Uh, I sometimes saw some of discussions like this in, for example, Adam Smith's work, The Wealth of the Nations, he also compares mercy and justice, the priority of mercy or justice. Uh, uh, you can find some issues in this line. One of the most, the another, one of the most important issues in Islamic social ethics is the preservation of human dignity. This is very important. If someone is insulted and humiliated in a society, there is no expectation of moral behavior. This is the narration. Islamic tradition state, states that the fate of those who are humiliated in society, whether they are humiliated by poverty or racist behavior, Sometimes they, they are poor, so this is a humiliation. So they have not opportunity to now to be present in classes or the university. These, these are also a sort of, some sorts of humiliations. So if a person or if a group of person humiliated in a society, so this is very dangerous for moral life of the society because there is no expectation of these persons to follow morality. So Islamic traditions state that the afraid of those who are humiliated in society, whether they are humiliated by poverty or racist behavior is very dangerous for the moral life of society. Of course, those who have helped to humiliate them by, you know, taking their rights, their monies or by, deceiving them by lying, by many things. Of course, those who have helped to humiliate them for any reason are involved in this destruction of social morality. So uh, to this uh, extent, I uh, you know, only wanted to say something about the moral questions in social life without uh, going to discuss them in detail. So, uh, I hope that you can follow uh, these uh, issues and uh, they, they, these are very important for social life and unfortunately they are neglected. We have no good material for discussion about the priority of justice or the, you, you are familiar with Islamic studies and sometimes you think you find one narration, for example, narration of uh, Zorara about Estesab, for example. There are many books written explaining this uh, tradition, but unfortunately, we have a tradition about the priority of justice over, for example, forgiveness or generosity, but we have no good material for discussion in the secondary uh, you know, literature. This is a, un un an unfortunate thing. So we need 
to you know product and to have more discussions of this sort. These issues are related to our social life, our moral social ethics. So they are important because if we uh, have not good society, uh, it is very difficult to have good moral persons. So I'm not uh, talking about the determination of society or you know the uh, necessary uh, affection of the society and person, but I am talking about the uh, you know uh, the contingent, but but with high probability of affecting a society on uh, moral personal life. So this is what uh, I uh, can say about the social ethics as well. So this was the last lecture, and we finished this short course. I apologize for some inconveniences in these 10 sessions. I'm thankful for your attention. And uh, I also would like to thank Dr. Jahangir, dear brother, Dr. Jahangir, Professor Jahangir, and also Mr. Azhar Reza for his help. And finally, the Amanullah, but I maybe have five questions I try to answer and then give. Goodbye to you. Salam, the lecture has been uploaded in the Islamic colleges. Mm, salam. Thank you for uploading it. It does not occur and arise as a serious concern of practical social ethics. Can one impose their view of morality upon others and in what form and what extent? Yes, government and the main reason. Yes, this is one of the uh, one of the important issues and uh, as I said that uh, maybe your intervention uh, in the society and in the social life for example enforcing some people to do this or uh, to you know leave these actions uh, sometimes this intervention itself makes some errors some some that uh, results, you know, uh, sometimes it, it may be considered or maybe regarded as, you know, insult and uh, humiliating of the other, uh, you know, autonomy. So this also is an uh, issue. So I, I just try to give the question, not the answer. So my answer, uh, I can give a short answer to this issue, but, but I, I didn't want to go to the you know detail of this issue because yeah you are right we have a responsibility or we have a collective collective responsibility or responsibility in the society so we have responsibility for social conduct uh, moral social conduct but but if I intervene always in the life of other person, my family or my brother or my sister or my friends, sometimes this can be regarded as insult. And uh, I told uh, about the danger of insult and humiliating. So this is a very uh, sharp issue, how we can intervene or uh, join uh, others to do some good things or forbidding others from doing bad things. How, how, this is very important, as you know, Fokaha says that uh, the only, maybe the only duty we have in Islam that mostly, uh, you know, based on your, uh, your thinking, uh, uh, your, uh, you know, conception of the situation depends on the situation is, uh, and the situation must be, you know, <laughs> distinguished, must be recognized by you. So you can find this situation good for intervening or for uh, joining or for forbidding. So it is not uh, absolute duty to do in all situation. Uh, this is uh, a situation depend on your, uh, you know, paralysis, your, your deliberation. This is an important thing. So uh, basically Islam accept the intervention of some people in the case of social life. This is accepted basically, but, but 
but basically also it depends on the situation. So in some cases, if you find that the intervention is, has more than just, has been regarded, maybe regarded as insult or humiliating of the others, so it is not okay. So this is the issue, but, uh, but it must be discussed more and more. Could you please display your first slide again? The summary is the joint work. Yes, and thank you. Yes, have you finished? Thank you. This is the first question. So thank you for, I have learned so much from you. No, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, I have not so much uh, ability to, you know, discuss or so have not time to discuss and I hope that in the future I can do better than this. This was the first experience of me in e-learning or learning from distance. And so I apologize for some inconvenience and I hope that you have good opinion or you have good conception of these classes, but I'm not sure because of my, you know, failure. So. Thank you very much, Salam. Yeah, very good advice. Good advice. Yes, surely. Yes, you are right. And thank you for your for advices and so I try to follow and uh, to do these, but uh, some of these is difficult for me because of some, you know, problems in uh, maybe have not so much uh, good background in some cases to do some of these advices, but mainly uh, I try to do this contemporary world, I think. Yes, yes, this is one of the defects of my classes of, of this lecture that we have not so much, you know, engaging in the dialogue or, or, you know, questioning and answering with the students and this. I just want to, uh, I'm sorry and I apologize. I hope that in the future we have a good, you know, dialogue and maybe engaging with the students. Also, if there could be a session, it should make it. Yes, and forgive me for, yeah, very, very, very good points. Yes, thank you. For no, thank you, but yes, just your kindness and these are some points and this show your kindness and I just uh, ask God inshallah help us have good maybe lectures or sessions in the future and this is my ability or my power, my power or my capacities but uh, I consider this class or this lectures mainly to propose or to give some question or to pay your attention to some discussions more than, you know, giving the answers to the questions because uh, this uh, short course, this short course uh, is not so uh, enough to discuss different issues of morality in these lectures. So thank you very much. So uh, I, uh, again, would like to thank all of you for your good comments and for your, uh, you know, encouraging uh, opinions. And so 
I hope that I can uh, do some of your advices in advices in the future, inshallah. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, uh, fasting months of Ramadan is coming, and uh, I hope that you remember me in your prayers and inshallah have a good, you know, prayers and good time for prayers and fastings, inshallah. Thank you very much and hope to see you again, inshallah. If it's okay to finish the session, uh, we have not any question. Can I end the lecture or stay for waiting for some questions? Dear brother Azhar, can I finish the lecture? So have you, I have no voice of you. I'm, I'm not sure you have my voice or not. It seems that there is no question and I just try to make no further burden, but further, further bother to you. Thank you very much.